We will go ahead and get started with this morning's webinar. A couple of housekeeping items I would like to point your attention to. You do have a control panel. If you're not familiar with the GoTo software, your orange box with the white arrow will allow you to expand or collapse your control panel. Everyone attending is currently in listen only mode. Uh, you do have a full screen option that you can toggle on and off. If that is off, you have the option to zoom and so you can resize your window. Different devices will show this in a different aspect ratio so you can customize that to suit your needs. Uh, there is a raise hand function, but since everyone is in listen only mode, uh, we're gonna rely on the questions pod. Uh, depending on your device, you may also have a chat pod. So at any time during the webinar, feel free to type in your questions. We will be stopping periodically to answer those questions. So if you think of it, go ahead and type it in. Uh, you do have a handout pod. If you expand the handout, you should have a handout for today's webinar. The one shown on the screen is, is not exactly the same title, but that will give you a PDF of the presentation that is being given today. And then the audio options are shown above that. So if you have any issues, hopefully if you are on, you're not having any issues, uh, but just type something in the chat pod to us if you are having any trouble. Um, at this point, let me point you to a couple of things. Uh, my name is Stacy Williams. I'm the director of CTTP and my email address is shown there. So if you have any questions logistically, you can um, send that to me. I also have the web address for the T-Square website for the Arkansas LTAP program. For today's webinar, it is um, the entire morning, so it goes until approximately 12.30. Um, I should have edited that. You will get four hours of Rhodes Scholar credit. It's a half-day class. Also, if you are a professional engineer, the certificate that you receive by email later on, probably early next week, will have those PDHs for you. So the Road Scholar credit is going to go toward the Arkansas T-Square Road Scholar program. And again, if you have any questions on that, send me an email. Your instructor today will be Dr. Jim Gaddis. Uh, he has worked for a municipal government consulting firm and for a number of years as a civil engineering professor here at the University of Arkansas. And he is now a professor emeritus. Dr. Gaddis has a lot of experience in exactly the topic that we are presenting today. Um, he has been involved in national scale research and very familiar with the MUTCD and the, the goings on with that and how that has evolved over the years. So we've got an expert who will be giving us lots of wonderful information. And so with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Gaddis. I'll let him share his screen. A couple of opening remarks. This class was developed with the idea that it would be presented live. And so some parts of this, as we proceed through the morning, will not quite fit uh, a remote audience, but uh, please realize that we're having to make accommodations because of the situation we're in. And the other thing, as you may have already guessed, this is my first time to ever present this class by video. So I am still learning all the buttons and bells and whistles. And uh, as we have already seen, I don't have all of it down yet. Uh, just so long as we don't accidentally launch nuclear missiles, I think we consider that uh, this has been a success. So please uh, uh, forbear as I try to uh, learn this process. Traffic signs markings and signals. The all-encompassing term for that is traffic control devices or TCDs. The use of TCDs is described in the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. How did we get this manual? From this table, you see that beginning in 1927, there have been a series of additions. It has evolved over the decades to currently, we are under the 2009 manual as revised in 2012. However, during this year, the federal government has been proceeding through the process of taking input, 
writing proposed passages to develop a new manual so we can guess that we would get a new manual in 2022. A branch of the federal government has been responsible for the MUTCD since 1971. There is a national body of individuals interested in and have, that have expertise with traffic control devices called the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. That group gives advice, makes suggestions to the Federal Highway Administration as to the content of the MUTCD, and as far as uh, also revisions too. All traffic control devices that are on roadways open to the public, even if it is a private roadway, are required to conform to the contents of the manual. Exceptions are bulleted in the lower part of the slide. This rule has been in place since 1971. That means that even on this private driveway leading to a hotel, that blue crosswalk and the non-conforming yellow signs are all violations of the MUTCD. And speaking of laws, each state will have in its state law references to the authority of the manual. A couple of excerpts from Arkansas law. You see the upper passage. Local entities are authorized to install traffic control devices with the caveat that they are to conform to the state manual. And then another passage specifically addressing school zones, they are to be in accordance with the current manual on uniform traffic control devices. So the MUTCD by inference becomes a law. Federal law requires substantial conformance. Each state either adopts the federal version of the MUTCD or develops its own similar version. State laws contain passages that require conformity with the MUTCD. You are probably watching this class because some part of your job deals with traffic control devices. Now consider if something goes wrong with one of those TCDs, do all of the employees in your organization know how to report problems? Do they know how to even recognize the problems? And does your agency have a method to quickly respond and rectify problems? Serious consequences arise when traffic control device problems go unattended, sometimes death. So you are probably charged with employing traffic control devices in some manner. What you're really trying to do is communicate with road users, but we want to do that in a way that conforms with the MUTCD. We're trying to let drivers, pedestrians, and bicyclists know about laws that affect their driving, such as speed limits, to give them warnings about something ahead, to provide them with navigational directions. But we have the question, how can your TCD be effective if it does not first communicate effectively? Think about it. Does a speed limit sign always control the speed? Did these pavement markings control the paths that the drivers place their vehicles in? Did these signs effectively control the actions of the motorist? I don't think so. 
So perhaps control is too strong of a word. You can see there can, are tragic outcomes when the control doesn't have its intended effect. We can't always compensate for poor roadway designs with traffic control devices. We can't make drivers become superhuman. And we certainly can't change the laws of physics, such as how long it takes a vehicle to stop. But what we can do is attempt to influence drivers, pedestrians, and bicyclists. Following the time-tested practices in the MUTCD increases your chances of being successful in influencing what drivers do. A couple of examples here. In the photo on the left, you see a roadway that curves to the left, and just after the left curve, it dead ends into a drainage ditch. If you can follow my mouse on the screen, there is an inadequate sign telling drivers that the road dead ends. It's not nearly large enough. It doesn't comply with the MUTCD. The photo on the right shows the outcome. One evening on a snowy night, a driver went around the curve into the drainage ditch and this clip is the record from the police call log where a neighbor reported car stuck in the ditch. An ineffective sign that didn't comply with the MUTCD in this case led to a rather comical outcome, but sometimes these outcomes can be rather serious. Here's a second example. These two parking spaces until recently had had signs that reserve them. In other words, they weren't available for general parking. But a couple of weeks before this photo was taken, those signs had been removed. They became fair game for anybody who wanted to park in the lot. And they were really the two prime spaces in the parking lot. Yet it took the passage of a number of weeks before drivers begin to realize that, hey, there has been a change here. I can start to park in these stalls. That's just one example to illustrate that even when a change occurs that may benefit drivers, they can take days or weeks to recognize that a change has taken place. Someone did a study to attempt to measure just how well did drivers recognize and recall the traffic control devices or other roadside messages they had passed. You see from this table that the results aren't totally encouraging. While there was 100% recall for speed limits, as you go through the other devices or messages, rather disappointing percent of drivers could actually tell you what they had just passed. A similar study was conducted more recently, also with similar less than stellar outcomes for driver uh, recognition and recalling what they had just passed by. So these two slides serve to indicate, to let us know that uh, traffic control device recognition is less than perfect. And it's somewhat of a mystery why this is. We understand the concept of visibility, putting a traffic control device out there in a way that drivers can see it. But the other aspect, making it conspicuous, making it grab the driver's attention, is less understood. People have developed theories for why drivers may not always uh, recognize and react to traffic control devices. But still, that's a perplexing problem for us to deal with. 
regardless of why it is, the outcome is understood that drivers seem to be oblivious to more than a few of the traffic control devices out there on the road. Given our situation that we deal with, you're more likely to be effective, improve your chances of success in communicating if you follow the MUTCD. One of the things the MUTCD seeks to accomplish is to have consistency and uniformity with signs and markings and signals that have been proven to be effective. In other words, whether a driver encounters a given situation, either in Portland, Maine, Portland, Oregon, or Portland, Arkansas, we want the driver to see the same treatment for that situation. So through experience, drivers learn what the control devices mean, almost at a subconscious level. In fact, one of the passages in the manual stresses the desirability of having uniform applications. The same shapes and colors. We wouldn't want to have a green stop sign. We want them all to be red so drivers can learn through experience. We want the devices to be adequate, to be sufficient, to be large enough so that drivers can detect them in advance and have enough time to react. Again, let's reflect on the implications of that. If you have a traffic control device on your roadway system and it does not conform, what's going to happen when subsequently a policeman issues a driver a ticket based on violating your non-conforming traffic control device? What's going to happen in court? Or more seriously, what's going to happen when a lawyer is able to convince a jury that your inadequate or non-conforming traffic control device was a causal factor in the collision of their client? I think we can start to see some pretty severe consequences for non-conformity. On a different note, as we go through this class today, you are going to encounter certain passages in the MUTCD that we might conclude, we might suspect, were placed in there simply because in the past, someone had gone off on a wild tangent and the writers of the MUTCD put that passage in to try to keep people from doing that again. This class today will hopefully help you do your job in a better way, help familiarize you with sources of information. We're going to talk about principles and applications of using traffic control devices. We have a number of examples of shortcomings so you can learn from others' mistakes. And of course, we need to recognize the real world limitations that only a few hours of a class is not going to make you an expert, but every bit of education will help. And in the real world, you have limitations that keep you from sometimes doing what you would like to do. But for better or for worse, your work is out there for all to see. Also, one of the objectives is to raise awareness, to stress the concept of thinking it through, cinching up your saddle before you mount up and ride. Look at this message sign, give cyclists a space. Yet they put that installation right in the middle of the bike lane. So they didn't very well give the cyclist a space, did they? wasn't very well thought through. The MUTCD is based on decades of experience. Before you install a traffic control device, first check to see what the MUTCD has to say. 
99.99% of the time, their way is going to be more effective than what you or I would come up with on our own. Again, hopefully this class will help you do your job better. Having said that, I'm going to close this module. So give me a moment to switch gears and go to the next one. All right, and at this point, if anyone has any questions, remember to post those in the questions pod. Um, another thing that we will be doing throughout the webinar, um, if there may be some uh, questions or things that in a normal classroom setting might be interactive and we'll also be able to use that question and answer pod for uh, you to submit maybe answers to a question that might be asked on a slide um, something to make it a little more interactive so keep that in mind as well but um, in addition to questions if you have any comments or situations that have come up uh, where something unique has happened feel free to post that as well Well, just a minute, there we go. Okay, module two, principles. Well, something didn't go right just a moment. You're not seeing what I've got on my screen. Pause. Give me just a minute. No, it's, it's not right. Okay. Nowhere. Okay, we got that straightened out. I'm not sure what happened, but uh, now we're where we need to be. Principles of using traffic control devices. Part of the challenge of using the manual is knowing the structure, the organization, understanding what I'm about to talk about will save you many hours of frustration. So we've got the overall manual. It is divided into a number of parts, separate parts for each topic. The parts in turn are subdivided into chapters. The chapters in turn are broken into sections. There is a method to the madness in the numbering sessions, uh, method sessions in sections, such as section 2C05. That means part two, chapter C, section five. This slide outlines the structure that we just alluded to. You have a part one, which contains some general information. Part two addresses signs. Part three for pavement markings. Part four for traffic signals. But there are also what I call, for lack of a better term, special topic parts. Parts five through nine, such as part seven for school areas, part nine for bicycle facilities, include all of the sign, marking, and signal information for that topic. Let me say that in a different way. If you wanted to look for a school zone sign, you would not find that in the part two devoted to signs, but rather you would find it in the special topic part devoted to schools. So while in general, part two addresses signs, it does not include all signs. If the sign you're looking for falls into one of these special topic categories, then 
you won't find that sign in two, you will find that in the applicable part for the special topic. The manual has four types of content. When something is a standard, when it is required, the passage will be accompanied with the verb shall. When a passage is giving you some guidance, something that is recommended but not required, you will see the verb should used. When they are presenting optional material, something that you can do, but it's not required, it's your option, you will see the verb may. And then a fourth type of content is simply background information given to help you see the bigger picture to provide context. Just like words matter, colors also matter. The manual has assigned these colors to different categories of use, such as blue is for road user services or tourist information or evacuation routes. So these colors are supposed to only be used for their particular approved applications. Well, again, if you're trying to effectively communicate, which is better, to change the colors up all the time so the drivers never see the same color in the same application, or to be consistent, to use the same color in the same way in all locations? Well, the answer is obvious. Consistency enhances your ability to effectively communicate. And speaking of color, let's bring in the issue of contrast. Certain colors do not show well with other colors. If you have ever been to Branson, Missouri and have tried to navigate, you may recall that to help visitors, they have color coded some of the routes through the town. One of the routes is the blue route. But you see, especially as you get in the time of day when you're looking into the sun, blue doesn't show well on the green background. How could they have done that better? Well, they could have used a border around the blue to make it stand out. Or they could have used a different shade of blue. Here again, what we're trying to emphasize, think about it. When you are about to put an application in, look at it critically. Is there a bug in your application? Is there something about the device or where it's installed that could be done better? Words matter, colors matter, but also shapes matter. Different shapes are assigned to different uses with signs. Regulatory signs have the shapes outlined here. Warning signs, many of them are diamond shaped, but there are some other variations. Guide signs are usually rectangular. The manual provides definitions. I have included a few select definitions to give you a little bit of the flavor of what's in part one of the manual. Centerline markings. The yellow lines that separate opposite directions of travel. But this is somewhat of a misnomer because the centerline markings do not have to be at the exact geometric center of the roadway. In fact, there are some applications where it's better to not put them at the center. We can talk about that later in this class. Edge line markings. 
can be either white or yellow, depending, depending on what. If the line is on the right side of traffic, it is a white edge line. If it is on the left side of traffic, and you would find this uh, typically on a roadway with a grass median in the middle, perhaps, then the left side line would be yellow. Lane line markings, white lines used to separate traffic going in the same direction. So what's our principle here? Yellow separates traffic streams in the opposite direction. White separates streams of traffic going in the same direction. The definition for crosswalk, let me pause and give you a moment to read that. Notice with that definition, you can have a crosswalk that is either marked, as I have tried to highlight here with purple lines, or you can have an unmarked crosswalk. Either one of these is a crosswalk. Just one is marked, the other is unmarked. The manual contains definitions, the good ones and the bad ones definitions that over time have proven to be effective. Well, what constitutes effective? Motorists can understand them. If they have been shown to be understandable, they are going to be in the list of acceptable abbreviations. If experience has shown that certain definitions lead to confusion or misinterpretation, then they are in the unacceptable abbreviations. So if you need to abbreviate something on a sign, first check with part one of the manual to see what abbreviations are approved, what abbreviations are unacceptable. The manual also suggests that for your particular jurisdiction, where there are multiple uh, options for an abbreviation, that you pick one of those options and stick with it throughout your jurisdiction. The manual also recognizes that in spite of the hundreds and hundreds of examples and variations that they have, there are going to be some situations that they have not covered and they give you the freedom to develop perhaps a new sign to address a situation not covered in the manual, but your sign is supposed to adhere to the principles you find in the manual. Low volume roads. If you have a roadway that fits into one of these defined categories, by volume, or other uh, factor that you see listed here. If that is the case, then the manual in part five has more relaxed requirements. They don't require as much of you. Here again, if you have a low volume situation, check to see if you fit the criteria at the beginning of part five. If you do, then you may find you don't need to uh, perhaps expend quite as much effort as you would if you're not in a low volume situation. And that is the end of module two. Stacy, do you want to ask for some questions? All right, as of right now, there are no questions in the questions pod. Um, as you think of things, go ahead and put those in, or just maybe something that's not necessarily related, related to exactly what was stated during the presentation, but maybe another question sort of along those lines, go ahead and type that in at any, any time. So at this point, we will get switched around for the third portion.
Well, once again, let's see here. Ta-da, it worked. That's it. <laughs> okay. We've talked about a lot of principles, and now we're going to start moving to more specific applications. But still, we'll not forget the principles either. Module three for signs. As we have already alluded to, separate parts of the MUTCD for different topics. Part two is for signs. Part two broken into the different chapters for the different categories of signs. And let me restate, some types of signs are going to be in what I call the special topic parts five through nine. So I'm going to restate, if you wanted to find a school zone sign, you would not find it in part two, but rather you would go to part seven. Regulatory signs, signs that convey laws. Typically colors are black, white, red, and green. The shape is usually rectangular. Some examples, what is a regulatory sign to help you grasp the term? Things that if violated mean that you have broken the law and you can get a traffic ticket. The second category of signs, warning signs. These are not laws. Typically, they are black on yellow. Diamond is the most common shape, but there are other shapes too. We want to put warning signs in advance of what it is we're trying to warn about, so drivers will have time to respond. And then in a little bit, we're going to actually go through the table and see how you apply it to know how far in advance I need to put a specific sign. Some types of warning signs are better, uh, not say installed or placed when they have an advisory speed panel below them. The third main type of sign is the guide sign, giving directions and information. The majority of these are going to be white letters on a green background. However, one of the uh, different variations is for cultural and recreational destinations. The colors are a back, excuse me, a brown background with white letters in front. There are other categories that constitute a rather small percentage of all the signs out there. I've just presented one example to illustrate that there are others besides the three main categories. The manual specifies a lot of detail, sizes, locations, Let's look at this excerpt. This is one small clip to give you an example of the information the manual gives you to help you do your job. Let's look at stop signs. Somewhere in the past, someone thought that all signs needed a code, so this is regulatory 1-1. This table tells you where to go read more about it. It tells you the minimum size of a stop sign, depending on the type of road situation you're dealing with. So the size of sign requirements vary according to the locational and other uh, factors. The manual recommends 
that for every 30 feet away from the sign that you need to be able to read it, that you have one inch of letter height. So if you needed to see a sign 90 feet away, the letter should be at least three inches high. In general, signs are to use uppercase letters, but there is an exception. If you're having a sign that gives the name of a place, a street name, then they are required, notice this is the shell, not optional, required, be made up of uppercase first letters followed by lowercase letters. And this is based on research that showed that for uh, destination names, drivers did better with mixed case rather than with all caps. So again, if you're a destination sign, then you don't use all capitals. When you have the mixture of upper and lower case, the lower case letters are to be three quarters of the height of the upper case letter. So if you had eight inch high letters for capitals, then the lower case would be three quarters of eight or six inches high. Also, the manual tells you not to stretch or compress the letters. This is just one example of what I referred to earlier in the class. Some passages seem to have been put in here to keep people from doing stuff they shouldn't have done. We've got a number of requirements or suggestions in this case, excuse me, for how high the letters need to be for street name signs, depending on the location and the speed. So we can start out with, you might say a default case. The uppercase letters are supposed to be six inches high for street name signs, and the lowercase four and a half inches high, three quarters of six. However, if you're on a multi-lane street with a speed limit greater than 40, then they bump that requirement up to eight inches for caps, six inches for lowercase. They do give you the option for this very low speed local road environment. It's okay to have four inch caps and three inch lowercase. I remember many years ago hearing someone with the Federal Highway Administration convey a bit of wisdom to me. Minimum requirements, minimum measurements, minimum whatever, are only good in minimum situations. So the four inch cap, three inch lowercase is only suitable in what you might call a very minimum situation. Otherwise, these are too small to be effective. If we have an overhead street name sign, we bump it up to 12 inch high uppercase and nine inch lowercase. Again, all of these requirements are based on decades of experience showing us what works, what gives the drivers the information they need versus what is inadequate and should not be followed anymore. The writers of the manual call these little icons pictographs. shall not be displayed on advance signs. If a pictograph is used, they suggest you put it on the left side of the sign, the left end. 
the Federal Highway Administration has developed a standard alphabet for highway signs, and only the approved fonts are to be used. There has been an ongoing squabble over a font called Clearview. At one time it was approved, then the Federal Highway Administration attempted to rescind the approval, <laughs> and then the developers of the font got their congressional delegation involved, and Congress uh, pressured FHWA to give an interim approval, so that issue of Clearview, approved or unapproved, has been bouncing back and forth like a tennis ball across the net. Clearance to the side. The manual clearly spells out that a sign is supposed to clear the edge of the road in a rural area by 12 feet. Now this is not 12 feet to the post, that's 12 feet to the near edge of the sign. And also a minimum height, five feet, not from the ground, but as measured from the bottom of the uh, traveled way surface here. If you have a shoulder that is wider than six feet, then the near edge of the sign is to clear the shoulder edge by at least six feet. If you're in an area where parking or pedestrian movements are likely to occur, we have a different requirement. The near edge, again, not the post, but the near edge of the sign, two feet recessed from the face of the curb. And the bottom of the sign, seven feet above the sidewalk or ground surface, not seven feet above the road, but above the ground or sidewalk surface. If you have a sign accompanied by a warning plaque, then you have a slightly different variation of the minimum required. For low volume roads, they give you a little flexibility. We previously said, remember, that the requirements for low volume roads are less stringent than for all of the rest. Overhead signs. The bottom of the sign should clear at least 17 feet above the pavement. We don't want tall vehicles to bump the bottom of the sign. Multiple signs. It's fairly common to have a situation where you need to put a number of signs in somewhat close proximity. In general, now there's going to be a lot of exceptions, but we're going to start with the principle. In general, you don't want to group a bunch of signs together. You want to separate them far enough apart so that drivers have time to react and read each one. However, like I said, there are a number of exceptions to this. You can read through this list. I'll pause a moment. Let's look at some pictures of some of these exceptions. Situations where Mounting a number of signs together actually makes sense and better communicates with the driver. One that I haven't shown here, but it is a good one. Street name signs on top of the stop sign is often a good place to put the street name signs. <coughs> Excuse me. I said earlier that we were going to also be looking at how far in advance do you need to place the warning sign. 
there is a table in the manual, and I've given you the page reference here. If you happen to have a manual at your side while we're going through this class, you could turn it to page 108 now. Hopefully this is big enough for everyone to read. How do we use this table? On the same page 108, this is the lower part of that page, the fine print tells you what you need to know. And there's more than one place in the manual where the key to figuring out is the small type that's uh, almost hidden, but that's where the important message is. I've tried to, you might say, give somewhat of a summary of all of this small type up above. You've got condition A and two types of condition B. And depending on which condition you're in affects the distance. It affects where in the table you go. So let me backtrack here. Notice we have a column for condition A. We have condition B for zero and then different speeds. So condition A examples merge, right lane ends, etc. Condition B zero miles an hour, where you need to come to a stop, such as stop sign ahead. Or condition B, where you need to slow down, but you don't need to slow down to zero miles per hour. Again, let's study the structure. So if the initial speed is one of these, you go to the row for, or down the column and find your initial speed, then you read in that row across, and depending upon whether you're a condition A or a condition B, and you find the proper speed you are decelerating to, the uh, intersection of your specific row and your specific column tells you the distance in advance you need to place your warning sign. Having said that, let's look at an example. You're driving down a road that has a speed of 45 miles an hour. A curve ahead is only good for 30 miles an hour. What sign do you need to have to warn you of the situation? And how far in advance of the beginning of that curve do you hope the government place that sign so that you will have enough time to respond? Let me go back to the table. Remember, again, 45 mile an hour road but the curve is only good for 30. I'm going to give you a few moments to look at the table. And if you are so inclined, uh, enter your answer into the, did you want the questions uh, or the check, Stacy? Uh, either one works. Okay. Uh, chat pod so everyone can see the answers. I think the questions pod just comes to me. Okay, so I'll pause a few moments. If you would enter your answer in the chat pod. Let's step through this. If we had been doing this class live, all the attendees would have a loaner MUTCD in front of them so they could turn the pages and find the signs in the MUTCD. 
The manual presents one sign called a W12, which shows a curve, except there's a separate sign called a W11 that's to be used when the suggested speed is less than or equal to 30 miles an hour. So this would be the appropriate sign and the distance in advance is 100 feet. Let's step back to the table. We're on a 45 mile an hour road. So we're in the 45 row. We need to slow to 30. So the intersection of the 45 row with the 30 column gives us 100 feet. <clears throat> the manual gives you some suggestions on where it would be beneficial to use warning beacons. There are certain situations where it's felt that uh, you might better communicate with drivers and get a better outcome if you uh, supplement your sign with a warning beacon. Placing signs in the street, generally not desirable, but there are a few exceptions. Of course, when you put the sign in the street, then you're going to have this outcome occasionally. You might look upon it as job security. But like I said, in general, we don't want signs out into the street. Retro reflectivity. We want the sign usually to be seen at night. There are a few cases where a sign perhaps only applies in daytime, but those are rare exceptions. For a few years, there has been a requirement in place that agencies that have traffic control devices, cities, counties, states, have in place a management method to keep track of reflectivity and know when signs have lost their retro reflectivity and replace them. The manual gives you a number of possible approaches, methods to keep track of retro reflectivity. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here. I mainly wish to just emphasize that this requirement does exist. I couldn't get all of the six methods on one slide, so I split it into two. Here's a website address to read more about it. And this is a publication that can be accessed by searching under this, these uh, keywords, you might say, to read more about the retro reflectivity requirements that each agency is supposed to be adhering to and following. Examples. This curve provided a good opportunity to show the series of signs for a pedestrian crossing. You've got the diamond pedestrian shape and the downward pointing arrow right at the crosswalk. And then in advance of the crosswalk, you have this assembly. This is different from how it was a number of years ago. Street names. It can be quite helpful for motorists who aren't familiar with the area to see both the name and the route number because some people may know it by the route number, others may know it by the name. So put both on the street name sign.
county road numbers. This yellow and blue sign is the MUTCD standard sign for county roads. This method works well when you have numbers for your county roads. However, it is a poor choice if your county roads happen to have names instead of numbers. Some counties use numbers, other counties use names. Why? Because if you got more than about three letters for the road name, then the letters are going to be squunched together and too small to be legible, as illustrated by this county road sign. And even with the contrast, you see spelling it out on a standard name sign versus trying to smash it all together on a road sign. Even if this sign is substandard, uh, what's wrong with it? Well, the letters aren't tall enough, as we read a few minutes ago, and they did not use a mixture of beginning capital followed by lowercase letters, but still, as inadequate as this is, that's a better alternative than the smashed together letters here. Again, the MUTCD standard sign really is only intended to be used when the county roads are numbered. Here's an example application where you want to give whoever did this an attaboy for thinking it through and uh, going the extra mile to provide good help for motorists. Let's describe the situation. You're driving down this highway in the blue car, and you know that you're supposed to turn left on the State Route 201. However, State Route 201 does not intersect your road. It's Highway 341 that intersects. What someone with the highway department did, they not only told the drivers you turn left here for 341, but if you wish to get to Highway 201, and I can't remember whether this was half a mile or a mile, but pretty close together, you also turn left here. It's not all that uncommon to find situations, maybe in a town where all of the routes do not intersect each other, but you have to follow an intermediate route to get to the ultimate highway you intend to follow. In those sorts of situations, providing additional information is a great help to motorists. Common problems, the wrong color, the wrong shape. What's this sign for right here? That's a school pedestrian sign, isn't it? This photo was taken in a Walmart parking lot. Now, I know Walmart's getting into a lot of different things, but I don't think they've gotten into public schools yet. So, Someone um, not quite ready for prime time who put that sign up. Here's another situation. You see school signs installed, but this is a university campus, not a grade kindergarten through 12. What's the difference? Colleges and universities do not run on the same timetable as grades K through 12. Grades K through 12, you typically start somewhere around eight-ish in the morning and run continually through three-ish in the afternoon when everybody lets out all at once. In contrast, to colleges and universities, students are coming and going all the time throughout the day because of the different and various class schedules. So you don't have the same time pattern at a college or university that you have at grades K through 12. In a college or university, they should not be using the 
school sign for pedestrians. They should be using the normal standard pedestrian sign. And of course, when you say no through trucks, is that a warning or is that regulation? That's a law. That's not a warning situation. That's a regulation situation. Someone should have looked at the manual before they installed the sign. Inadequate fonts, smushing the letters together to make the sign difficult to read. Letters so small that even if you're at the front of the queue, you can barely read the instructions here. This is not something that I have seen scientifically investigated. But just from my impressions, again, this is unscientific, just an observation. Over the last two decades, perhaps, there has been a growing problem with growing vegetation, obscuring signs that used to not be obscured. The uh, shrub and tree trimming activities have not kept up with growth. You're driving down the street. Can you see the stop sign here? There's a collision waiting to happen. Now, here's a case of where the warning sign is almost brand new and they installed it, you know, right past the tree branch. They should have had the branch loppers along with the, uh, the uh, driving the post equipment. These skid marks tell the story for this obscured stop sign. Someone is not uh, keeping things up to snuff here. Another problem, the sign position. Now this is going to require some explanation, some background, so let me explain what's going on here. Remember that example from a number of minutes ago where the driver drove off the dead end road into the drainage ditch? This is that. The street comes to an end past the curve, and then there's a drainage channel. At the end of the dead end street, there's a driveway. And I gave you these dimensions just to help you get a sense of perspective and proportion. The city came out and installed these three signs that I've indicated by these three lines here at about this relative position to the driveway. I'm going to pause just a little bit and ask you to do some head scratching and imagining what's going to happen at the end of a dead end street with the driveway. If you are good at envisioning things, you realize that you come to the end of a dead end street, you pull in the driveway, you back out and pull forward. Except in this case, you back out and hit the signs that were put too close to the driveway. Now, you know, hindsight's always 2020, but it would have been perhaps a better choice if they had put these signs maybe another five feet down the ditch and not quite so close to the driveway. <clears throat> Yesterday, I was uh, on the phone with my wife and she told me that the city had come out that day and had reinstalled two of these signs that had been recently knocked down. Wrong position. Going back to the graphic we saw earlier, where parking or pedestrian movements are likely, the minimum height to the bottom as measured from the sidewalk or ground surface, seven feet minimum. What do we have here? A pedestrian 
blocking the bottom part of the sign. So if you're across the intersection, you think you got a no left turn, but actually what you got is no left only during the morning and evening rush hours. Again, they put the sign too low. It looks like they could have easily put it higher and have made the sign adequately visible to oncoming traffic. Another example of wrong position. I took this photo standing at the edge of a marked crosswalk. This sign too low, they didn't comply, conform to the requirements of the manual. And so what's the effect? You're having a vision obstruction. What's the liability potential here if a pedestrian is struck in the crosswalk? Well, it doesn't take just a lot of imagination to realize that uh, there could be a sizable payout by a jury to someone who was injured as a result of not following the MUTCD. Another positional problem. We've got the guide signs here for Highway 8 and Highway 13. Oh, but wait, that's wrong. Really highway 18 and Highway 13. These signs were put too close to the edge of the street. And we can guess that the side mirror from a semi truck caught this sign and neatly folded it back. The requirements in the manual are there because of years of experience with showing what works and what doesn't work. These are not just arbitrarily rules made up. They're there to help you do your job better to be more effective. Here's a case that's the other end of the spectrum. Perhaps this sign could have been placed closer to the roadway in this grassy planted area. So it would fall more within the driver's field of view and not be so much in uh, the peripheral vision area. The, dry, the sign would have been more conspicuous out here rather than its actual position. Continuing with wrong position examples, misaligned over the intended lane. Signs trying to either regulate lane use or to give you directions but not placed over the proper lane to which they apply. One sign blocking another sign. In this situation especially, it seems like it took more effort to do it wrong than it would have taken to set this sign out to the side where motors could actually see it. Let me explain this situation. You've got a multi-lane road with a grass median in the middle. Someone put a one-way sign out here in the median that leads to driver confusion. Is the road one way or two way? Well, one half of the road goes one direction. The other half of the road goes the other direction, which is usually what happens with roads that carry both directions of traffic, right? Not only unnecessary, but actually creating confusion. The manual addresses this. Again, we can suspect because the writers of the manual have seen uh, misuse such as this of one-way signs and have tried to provide clear direction about how to handle these situations. If your median is less than 30 feet, 
then you do not put one-way signs in the median. You do put, if you want to, one-way signs on the far sides. Notice it says the one-way signs are optional if you have the keep right signs here in the median noses. Again, if the median is less than 30 feet, do not put one-way signs in the median. What's our situation here? You're approaching an intersection. You've got some pavement markings that tell you these two lanes are left turn only. This single lane is for both through and right turn movements. That's somewhat visible if you don't have a lot of traffic on the road. But what happens later in the day when all the commercial activity starts to generate a lot more cars and the cars are sitting on top of these pavement marking arrows then the driver comes up here there's no sign to tell the driver which lanes are which we really need some extra guidance here we need some signs telling drivers what the different lanes are for which lanes have to turn left Look at this situation. We've got a left turn arrow here. And we've got something here that's sort of worn away. We, we can see there's a right turn arrow there. Now, actually, drivers are making left turns from both lanes, but because the pavement marking has been worn off, there's really nothing telling this driver that they need to watch their path when they turn left because they're going to have a concentric left turn right next to them. This could easily lead to a side swipe because this driver doesn't realize somebody else is going to also be turning left. And I would say that the agency would be at fault for not providing the necessary lane use signs here. There needs to be signs telling drivers that there are going to be left turns from both of these lanes. There we go, it didn't change for me. What's the situation here? There's not enough signs. At first, it's not evident what's going on here. Well, when I drove over this piece of road a few years ago, it wasn't evident to me because just past the crest of this little rise, all of a sudden this lane ends and you have to merge left, but there's no sign giving the driver that information. Now, during light traffic, no problem, but if you had more traffic on the road, this sudden unexpected surprise could lead to a side swipe collision because of the absence of the needed sign. <laughs> the lane control signs should be placed both in advance of the intersection and at the intersection where the mandatory lane movement regulation applies. Here's a case in point. This poor driver popped over the crest of a hill and found themselves in a mandatory left turn movement, but apparently they didn't want to go left. They were kind of left hanging out to dry by the absence of adequate traffic sign information. Do you have situations in your jurisdiction that flood 
from time to time. If so, you need signs telling motorists that there's a potential roadway flooding uh, location here. At this particular <laughs> location, someone died because of driving into high water at night. And this sign seems to have been placed after the unfortunate event occurred because I searched back earlier on Google Earth and the sign was not in place. It would have been good if this sign had been installed before somebody got killed. But regardless, that's not the actual sign that should be used. The MBTCD covers that situation with the recommended sign. It's not commonly the problem of having too many. Usually it's not enough signs, but this is a case where probably the superfluous sign should have been removed not to overdo things. Earlier we said generally, <laughs> generally signs in the streets were not allowed. And we're going to address that now. What's going to happen when a vehicle strikes these non-conforming prohibited types of installations? Well, you're going to have heavy metal objects slingshotting out into traffic, pedestrians, whatever. Not a good potential. Signs need maintenance. In a previous training session, when we held them in person live, one uh, agency responded that they send their faded signs to a sheeting company and get them recovered instead of just sending them to the scrap dealer. Now, I don't know if that would work for you or not, but something to consider whether that would uh, be a cost saving measure for you. Someone tried to reuse a sign here, but they didn't remove the old, uh, let's say message, symbol message. And you really got some potential for creating a problem such as a collision perhaps on a rainy, foggy night. So not good. The use of arrows, this seems to be an aspect of signing which sometimes causes fits. We've got something missing here. You're approaching this. You're, you're left to your own imagination and confusion. Should I turn left or go straight to get to 62? We need to have another arrow here giving the driver adequate direction left through or right to get to 62. How do you handle this situation if you come up to it? Well, that's a real head scratcher. <coughs> Here's the actual situation. The driver, <laughs> excuse me, the driver is here. Here's the one-way street. Highways 202 and 35 are actually a block ahead. So here's the sign they had. Here is the sign they should have had. Unless you're turning right, right at this location, you don't have that sign. If you're turning right somewhere up ahead, you need an arrow with a stem on it.
placed in advance of an intersection where a turn must be made. So if the directional arrow is in advance of the actual turn location, again, an arrow with a vertical stem is called for. Okay, we've talked about the principle. Now you evaluate the application. We've got situation A. A arrow with a stem and we're about one half of a block in advance. So this is a correct application. You're still driving down the road some distance before you turn left to follow the route. B. Right at this intersection, you turn right to follow 79B, but you do proceed some distance ahead before you turn left to follow 278B. So again, a good application. But look at C. This sign is installed at the intersection, not in advance, but at the intersection. They have these stems. Someone didn't get the memo. Someone did it wrong. These arrows should not have vertical stems on them because they are at the point, they're at the intersection where the turn is to be made. We have talked a lot about the principles. You evaluate these. What do you think? For a street name, we've got letters that are too small. They used all caps instead of initial capital with following lowercase. And we've certainly got the wrong color. So all the way around, they get a grade of F on that. What about this application? We can't know for sure, but that suspiciously looks like someone was trying to set up a 30 mile an hour speed limit. That's not a regulatory sign. That is a warning plaque. What's going on here? What's the inadequacy? Oh, by the way, this is not a sign pole base. This is a base for what had been a street light. Look at the lane, what happens to the lane? That's a mandatory right turn lane, but there's no sign telling the drivers that the right lane must turn right. Here's one that puzzles me, and maybe there's a good explanation, but if, if there is, I don't know about it. You're on the street entering the parking lot. You see the signs enter only. Okay. But you're inside the parking lot headed toward the street. You don't see any signs. Do they have that backwards? It's not the people on the street that need to see enter only. It's the people inside the parking lot that need to see do not enter wrong way. Um, whoever did this job, it seems to me like they're not quite up to speed on thinking through traffic situations. Evaluate these for color. No parking any time. That should be the standard red letters. Uh, 
a prohibition in green, no left turn to park. Green is a permissive type of sign. Okay. We are at a point in time where we need to take a break. And I'm going to see if I can set the. Okay, we do have a few questions if oh, you have a few minutes for that. Well, thank you. I had not seen that. So, uh, can you convey the questions to me? Yes. So, the first question is regarding street signs at an intersection with the street names. When you have the two different street names, is there a standard convention for which name goes on top and which one goes on bottom? Let me make sure I understand. The intersecting streets, does it have one name go to the left and a separate name to the right? And no, one street goes through, the other one intersects at a 90 degree. And so it's like the, the both street name signs would be on the same pole, but 90 degrees from each other. Hmm. I'm not aware of anything that dictates which one comes first. Okay. All right. And then we had another question about pedestrian crossing signs. And what was said was that they have their pedestrian crossing signs in the street, but they always get run over, just like the ones that you showed in the presentation. Um, what rules, if any, apply to having them permanently installed um, on the side of the road? On the side of the road, we're talking about outside of the traveled way. Uh, Correct. Nothing different with that than any other. Um, when they, well, just a minute, I may have misinterpreted that. Or uh, let me call the slide back up just a minute. Let's get that in front of us here. Okay. And give me a moment to search. Or, and I've got one, <laughs> one screen blocking another there. Let me find it. Okay. This rep, come on. Now it's okay. I'm a little confused here. I'm not showing my screen. Just a minute. There we go. Okay. Now let me get back here. Finally, well, it's a little slow to react. I, I saw it on my screen before you all saw it on yours. Are you talking about this particular type of sign? Um, that part is not included in the question, uh, okay. but it, pedestrian crossing signs that they put in the street. So it would be very similar to that. Maybe not the school version, but. Well, these signs, we, we can't know exactly what the person meant, so let me try to answer broadly and hopefully as I cast a net, I will include what they're asking, but I may address more than they're asking too. These signs are for installation only in the road, but there are other pedestrian signs. And again, let's see if I can call that up right quickly. Okay. Well, I am not getting the magic to happen here. There's the standard pedestrian signs that you put on the side of the road. In other words, you wouldn't put these signs to the side of the road. You would put the standard pedestrian sign. Uh, 
I hopefully addressed what was being asked. Yes, I think that's good. Uh, we do have one other question that deals with a roadway that has a curve uh, that during a rain event almost always has a car in the ditch. They put up a slippery when wet sign, but it hasn't done any good. Other ideas? Here again, without knowing the specific situation, it's a little challenging to uh, perhaps address it, but it may be a situation that's perhaps not addressed well with a traffic control device. This may be a pavement texture problem. So that gets into your area, Dr. Williams. Uh, you may need a surface friction treatment in the area to give the, the drivers more friction uh, as they go around the curve would be one thought. Uh, again, a, a sign itself may not bring about the desired result. And that, that question <coughs> emphasizes what we talked about earlier, that we call them traffic control devices, but what we're really doing is trying to influence drivers, and we are certainly less than 100% successful in trying to address them. So, uh, you know, so sometimes we get a partial effect, but we don't get 100% benefits from what we try to do because drivers do run stop signs. In this case, drivers do go around the curve too fast in spite of our, our best efforts. So a, a traffic control device alone may not provide a, a solution or a remedy. All right, very good. That is all that we have right now in terms of questions. So I believe now we will take a 10 minute break. Is that correct? Uh, let me stop sharing the webcam there. And I think I hit the wrong, there we go. Aha, okay, well at least one thing worked. Let me uh, start the timer. There we go. All right, at this time, we'll take a 10 minute break and come back and do the next module. Wanted to bring up the uh, question about the street name sign that was uh, raised before the break. You've got two situations that I can think of. Sometimes street name signs are standing alone, one on top of the other. And sometimes they're mounted on top of stop signs. Your order, if you got a stop sign there, is going to be somewhat controlled, no more than somewhat, it's going to be controlled by the orientation of your sign mounting brackets. And I don't know the different brackets out there. What I'm used to seeing is that the bracket that's affixed to the stop of the stop, uh, top of the stop sign, that's easy to say backwards, allows you to put the street name perpendicular to the stop sign. So in that case, the order of the street names is going to be dictated by the nature of your bracket uh, orientation that goes on top of the stop sign. However, if the two signs for the perpendicular intersecting streets are not on a stop sign, then you're not controlled by the stop sign bracket I haven't, I don't, don't recall anyway, hearing that question raised before, but without going into the manual, my first inclination would be the major of the two streets, the street that's got the greater of the two volumes or is the more important street would be the one I would put on top. Hope that helps. A little slow to respond there on the uh, screen, so I paused while the computer finally, and it's still not wanting to move quickly. There we go. Give me just a moment to resize some windows. Like I said, it's a little bit of a lag time to respond. I think we are up and running now. 
pavement markings. Part three of the manual tells us how to use, how to install, how to apply in certain situations, the pavement markings. Colors, yellow and white are the most uh, used colors, but there also are a limited number of uses for red, blue, and other colors. White markings, as we said earlier, separate directions of flow uh, that are going in the same direction. They're used to mark the right edge of the roadway. They're used for stop lines and yield lines and for crosswalks. Notice the manual says parking stalls are supposed to be in white. A solid white line by itself is intended to discourage crossing over, but does not prohibit crossing over. If you want to prohibit crossing over white lines, then you use a double white line. Yellow markings to separate travel in opposite directions. The manual says that if you have a roadway that's 20 feet or more wide and 6,000 vehicles per day or more, then you are required to have center line markings. You are also required to have center line markings if you have three or more lanes for moving traffic. Examples out of the manual, a broken type of dash with gaps means passing is allowed. Where you have a solid line on one side and then the dash on the other, that means that passing is prohibited in the direction of the side that has the solid line or you have double yellow, passing is prohibited in either direction. Another example where something appears to be in the manual to keep people from doing something. They say a single solid yellow line shall not be used as a center line marker on a two lane roadway. If you intend for there to be no passing, it is to be a double yellow line. This is an example of using edge lines on a roadway with a median, a divided roadway. The outer edge lines are white. The inner edge lines are yellow. The example for center two-way left turn lanes. As we said, there are other colors that have limited uses. We see blue used for handicapped marking spaces. The common pattern for broken lines is one part line and three parts skip. And this often translates into a 10 foot line, a 30 foot omission, another 10 foot line. And the lines are to be at least four inches wide. In recent years, we have started to see more applications of wider perhaps going up to six inch wide lines. Now this is for edge lines and lane lines. Lines that are diagonal need to be much wider in order to have a adequate visual impact. We've already said that traffic control devices 
do not always achieve what we wish because drivers are human, drivers are imperfect. Crosswalks are not always a magical fix. Here's a reference publication that compared how well marked and unmarked crosswalks performed as far as safety. And you see that the, the results were sort of mixed. Um, marked crosswalks did not always uh, make all of the pedestrian collisions go away. Comparing styles of crosswalks. Again, at the bottom of the slide, you've got the reference if you want to read more about it. Of course, this would be in the handouts. Which of the three styles is more effective? You've got the, the paired bars you've got this the big bars and the traditional you might call them parallel lines under a number of scenarios this option the parallel lines was less visible than the other two options Putting together a crosswalk installation. We can start out by projecting a measurement or a line across the intersecting road, measuring back at least two feet of clearance for the edge of the crosswalk. The inside width of the crosswalk, at least six feet. The distance from this side of the crosswalk back to the stop line, four feet. And the stop line, 12 to 24 inches here. So you add all of this up, two feet plus six feet, there's eight, four is 12 plus the width of these lines, let's just call it 13 to round it evenly. And then back to here, you're talking about, you know, roughly 14, 15 feet, somewhere in that range, to get back to the near side of the stop line. One of the recommendations that has appeared in recent years is to, when you're placing this style of crosswalk, put these bars in such a location, if you can, where you avoid the paths, the tire paths of the heavier vehicles, especially. What are your constraints? Well, we've got at least a six foot wide crosswalk. And we have some flexibility. We can sort of stretch these or compress these like an accordion. These bars are supposed to be somewhere between one and two feet wide. The spacing between the bars just some multiple of two and a half times the line width. And you can vary this from one foot to five feet. So playing around with how wide your lane is, you can work up some combination of bar width and spacing between the bars so you miss the paths of the vehicle tires, get less wear and tear, get more life out of your crosswalk markings. Stop lines. Drivers don't always stop where the stop lines are.
So you may question just how important are the stop lines? Well, like with a lot of things in life, it varies. And the situation where stop lines are especially important is the one I've described here. It's a little hard to get everything in a field of view. This greenish line is indicating someone on this road making a left turn around here. And in that case, having this stop line here is very important to stop the people in this left turn lane far short of this area so that these left turners aren't clipping the left front corner of these left turners. Here again, some situations are such that stop lines are much more important than in other situations. This is a situation where stop lines are very beneficial. Speaking of stop lines, this roadway had a right turning lane separate from the through lanes there. They put the stop line up here just a few feet back from the edge of the intersection. And what is the effect of that? Well, as we said, drivers don't always stop at the stop lines, but perhaps the stop lines influence a number of drivers, if not all of them. But these drivers are so close to the intersection or in their stopped positions that they block the line of sight from somebody making the right turn. It would have been desirable for this stop line to have been placed back many more feet from the intersection to leave this area open for the right turn driver's field of view. Parking stalls. The MUTCD has drawings showing you how to dimension eight feet wide or an end space 20 feet. If you're not at the end, 22 to 26 feet. But notice you don't want parking stalls close to the crosswalk because, again, a parked vehicle can create a visual obstruction. Curb markings. The MUTCD says, in general, curb markings alone are inadequate. You need signs along with curb markings, but there are some exceptions. For situations that drivers are expected to know, such as not parking in front of a fire hydrant or blocking a driveway or parking too close to a crosswalk, then painted curbs without a sign can be okay. If you find that your curb has frequent tire marks on it, you may have a problem with more than just painting the curb. You may have a roadway design problem. It may be not that you haven't painted the curb enough, but that the curb was actually put in a poor location. And this situation may not be solved with curb painting. You may need to reconstruct the curb so it's not getting hit. Diagonal cross hatching, which is correct, <coughs> orienting the lines in this direction or orienting the crosshatch lines in that pattern. Well, this is wrong. If your diagonal hatching lines look like an invitation for narrow angle parking, then you have them in the wrong orientation. The diagonal lines should be oriented so that it creates somewhat of a, the, uh, visualization of a barrier to going across them. And as we said a few moments ago, diagonal lines 
need to be much wider than the four inch that you use as a minimum for lane lines and center lines. Depending on the speed, at least eight or at least 12 inches wide. You may get a request for pavement art. Um, these can be ongoing maintenance headaches. There's been a lot of less than successful applications by putting pavement art in the street. And it's also a, a, a questionable practice about trying to put art in crosswalks. That's an area that's uh, under current study. We may see some outcomes from the study that change the practice, but for right now, it's uh, not looked upon favorably. Here's a hint. If you're marking bike lanes and putting the symbols in the bike lane area, place these arrows and bike icons in a location where it's less likely to get vehicle or traffic. In other words, if you put it in a driveway, you're going to get extra unneeded wear on the icon and the arrow. Try to find a location where vehicles aren't going to be running over your pavement surface markings. And apparently when you're performing pavement marking, it's always good to check the forecast before you go out and, you know, we call it paint, but it may be thermoplastic, but uh, regardless, Check the weather first. Removing old markings, just painting over old markings may not cut it because the paint will wear off that, that you use, the paint that you use to cover the old marking will wear off. And once again, the old marking will be exposed, creating driver confusion. Just where exactly is the edge of the lane? Where is the center line exactly? As we said, center lines not only don't have to be in the middle of the road, sometimes it can be quite beneficial to offset the center lines. Here, by offsetting the center line to one side, we've created adequate space for on-street parking on one side, plus two moving lanes of traffic. Let's look at an application or two applications actually. Look where they put the lines. How did the lines line up with the median noses? Let's stop and think through what we're doing. The lines not only separate the different spaces, but they also guide drivers ahead into the intended path. Or if I say that into the intended path ahead, perhaps would be better wording. Well, which of these installations takes drivers where you intend them to ahead, and which one doesn't? Over on the right, you see that the center line guides drivers and their vehicles past the edge of the curb, whereas On the left photo, the line here leads a driver and their vehicle right into the end of the median nose. So we've got a poorly placed lane line here. Now, what do you think? We've got lines A, B, C, and D. Color, position. Let's look at line A. We might call this the good, the bad, and the ugly. What's it doing? It's separating directions in the same direction, directions of travel going the same. So line A is okay, a white line. 
B, the arrow. Well, I don't know if that's the best shape. It's uh, probably not as good as it could be, but still okay. Might have could have used a little, little larger line thickness here. How about line C? It's separating opposite directions of travel. It should be yellow, not white. And I suspect they intend it to be uh, no passing, so it probably should be a double yellow. How about line D? It's a little hard to see in the background. Hopefully you can pick it out. Separating opposite directions of travel should be yellow, but also notice the alignment. It's leading these vehicles to go ahead right into half of the turn lane. This line should have been laid at somewhat of a skew or a angle to channel to funnel traffic to drive ahead to line up into this area, this path, this space. Another example for you to evaluate, you've got lines A, B, C, and D. Stacy, this would be a good time for the chat pod for everybody to pick one of these four is incorrect. So enter in the chat pod, either A, B, C, or D, which of the four is incorrect. And before I forget, I need to address an optical illusion. This is simply a trick of the camera angle. This line A, if you were standing out there where the photo was taken, you would see that line A does actually align fairly well across the uh, intersecting road with the far side. So they're visually on the, the photo, it looks like there's a, an alignment problem, but no, this line does line up fairly well with the line on the far side of the intersection. So don't let that fool you. So which one is wrong, A, B, C, or D? And just enter your answers in either the question pod or the chat pod. Uh, it looks like some of you do not have access to the chat pod. So go ahead and use the questions pod. And we have a number of answers coming in that letter C is incorrect. Um, that is the majority, it looks like. Well, the, the majority rules. So it appears that uh, most of the audience out there correctly identified that C should have been a white line because it is separating traffic going in the same direction. A traffic going in the same direction, white, that's good. B, you've got double yellow separating opposite directions of travel, that's good. D, double yellow separating opposite directions of travel, that's good. So C is the offender here, should have been a white line. What do you think about the cross hatching? Now, let's don't address the color of it, that's a separate issue, but Notice over time, one crew painted the diagonals, we might call that the lighter yellow in this orientation, and another crew using more of an orange yellow paint put the diagonals in this orientation. So let's uh, once again go with the chat pod. If you think this is the correct orientation, type in orange. If you think the lighter yellow was the correct orientation, type in yellow. Orange or yellow.
All right, it looks like most of the answers coming in are saying that the orange is correct and uh, the yellow one is incorrect. That is correct. Notice the orange lines, put yourself in the driver's seat where I took the photo from. The orange lines appear somewhat like a barrier to crossing over to entering. That's right. The yellow lines look like narrow angle parking stalls. Those are incorrect. And there was one other comment about the orange lines look like they may extend a little too far into the traffic lane. Here again, uh, that could be an, uh, yeah, just a optical illusion from the photo. And it's been a number of years since I took that photograph, but I may have moved my car over to the right just so I could you know, get everything in the camera angle that I wanted to include. So there's no guarantee that I was actually fully in my lane when I took the photo either. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of things we can't know without, uh, without seeing the big picture. And once again, the uh, ability to change slides disappeared. There we go, it's activated again. Let's look at this cross hatching. Let's evaluate it. Well, look at the orientation. They got the orientation correct. Look at the thickness of the lines. Too thin. They should have used at least double this thickness, probably. And they could have probably used fewer lines. but they needed thicker lines, but also look at the color. This area is dividing opposite directions of travel. So these should have been yellow lines, not white lines. Maintenance. Now this was shot in broad daylight, if I remember correctly, it was mid-morning, but that's been a long time since I took the photo, too. But how visible is that going to be on a drizzly, foggy night? Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, about minus 5. Very ineffective, uh, long since overdue for maintenance for being restriped. What do you think about this installation? Here's our crosswalk. Here's our stop sign. Probably most of you have heard the expression putting the cart before the horse. Well, they've got the crosswalk and the stop sign out of order. The stop sign should be in advance of the crosswalk. Um, just, what were they thinking? <laughs> what do you think about the crosswalk here? Notice how close it is to the parallel parking. We're creating visual obstructions, pedestrians stepping out and being hidden to oncoming traffic because of the parked cars. Here, traffic is moving from right to left. This is on the far side of that median here. Here's the, these flowers are the same as these flowers. <coughs> what happens if a vehicle is parked at the curb, parallel park, and they want to get out of their stall? What do they do? They back up right into a crosswalk and pedestrians will be in their blind spot. So both in both pictures, you've got marked parallel parking stalls too close to a crosswalk. You need to have some separation there. And again, the manual tells you that if someone had just, like we said at the beginning of the class, gone and looked it up in the manual before they mounted up and rode off, they would have received the information. They would have learned what to do and what not to do. 
This is a tricky one here. This is requires three dimensional perspective. What's the problem here? Well, you can't really guess it from looking at just a plan view. And that's my point. Just looking at a drawing itself in plan view may not give you the information you need to avoid a problem. Notice the right turn lane here and the pedestrian crosswalk from the sidewalk out to this island. Your line of sight, and again, you can't tell this from a plan view, your line of sight is such that this elevated parking lot and these shrubs create a visual obstruction. They block this right turn driver's view of pedestrians getting out into the crosswalk. So not only do you have to look in two dimensions, you need to check in three dimensions to make sure your layout is not creating a safety problem. And I will now attempt to shift gears here and go to the next one. And before you leave that, whoops, I may have missed it. Um, there was a comment on the the A, B, C, and D lines, the picture that you showed and had all of the participants identified that C was wrong. There was a comment about the arrows between C and D being wrong. I cannot remember that actual installation. Here again, how things actually lined up out there I do not recall. From our perspective, yes, it appears that they are wrong, but I would need to go back up there and look at the field to see. Like I said, I know there was a, with the photo, we are not getting the correct impression of how things actually line up. Um, I would have to go look, look at the real life situation. Um, this street may be wide enough where somebody can make a through movement here and let's say kind of veer across the intersection successfully. I, I do not recall, I do not frequent that location with any regularity to remember how that is, but that's a good observation. Maybe a problem here, but we would need to know more. Very good. And then while you are switching to the next module, we did get a comment about the perpendicular uh, street name signs at an intersection, um, a comment that the road you were coming up to with the stop is supposed to be on the stop sign, and then the road you are on is supposed to be on the top, which would indicate that the sign mounted directly above the stop sign would be facing the driver so perpendicular to the direction of travel and then the sign placed on top would be per, uh, parallel to the direction of travel no i am not recalling the different variation in brackets the the bracket is going to be the tail that wags the dog there so i uh, I would have to look in more. I do not have a, uh, a ready answer for that question, but that's that's the first time I think I hear that mention. It's something for me to look into for future classes and to also to uh, pay more attention to the brackets I see out there. And uh, I can recall one style of bracket, but I don't, re you know, I may be not recalling a number of other brackets too. 
All right, very good. Um, at this time, there are no other questions or comments in that questions pod. Um, I would like to direct you all in case you do not have the MUTCD at this time, it is available. You can download it as a PDF on the Federal Highway Administration website. Uh, that web address is mutcd.fhwa.dot.gov. <clears throat> Speed limits in school areas. I've combined these two topics together. Speed limits are a troubling problem because you have sometimes two groups of people with different perspectives. The people that live immediately along the street want everybody to drive at snail's pace, but the broader general public wants unimpeded travel. Here's an example of the contention that can arise over speed enforcement from a few years ago. I clipped some headlines and, um, and paragraphs from a news story. This Arkansas town was uh, rigorously enforcing the speed limit on the highway that went through it. And uh, they uh, ran afoul of the state's speed trap law. The immediate community uh, was wanting to enforce the speed limit more, and the broader public felt like uh, the town was basically just creating a speed trap. Laws are going to vary by state, but I think in principle, you're going to find what we see here applicable broadly. Most states are going to have a, uh, a, a set default speed limit in towns and on rural roads. And then in Arkansas, the county road default speed limit is 40 miles an hour. But notice again, Arkansas law says that the devices that are installed must conform to the manual. Local authorities are given some latitude in setting a different speed limit. Notice according to Arkansas law, to set a different speed limit, there's supposed to have first been an engineering and traffic investigation performed. For school zones, Arkansas law spells out and defines the practice. Again, <clears throat> it is supposed to be done in accordance with what's in the MUTCD. Establishing a speed limit other than you might say the default in the state law again requires an engineering study for it to be done in a for the change to be done in accordance with law. And speed limits are supposed to be installed in five mile an hour increments, not some sort of odd number. I'm not going to dwell on this to any great extent. I'm going to speed through this, but briefly mention how a, <coughs> excuse me, a speed limit uh, study would uh, influence the speed that you set. If we look at speed distributions, you're going to find that a lot of the drivers are within a kind of a central range and only a few outliers are going greatly above the central lane, a range. 
a few outliers well below the central lanes, but most of this group of drivers will be in a five to 10 mile an hour range in here and setting the speed limit at the upper end of the five to 10 mile an hour range encourages traffic to all be grouped together in a rather narrow range of speeds. <clears throat> and the MUTCD recommends setting the speed limit within five miles an hour of the speed that 85% of the drivers are going at or less than. In other words, only 15% of the drivers are going faster than. A software program has been developed where you enter some inputs and it spits out a recommended speed. In some jurisdictions, they have the practice of not having big drops in the speed, but if you're having to change from say 60 to 30, stepping down in increments of 10 to 15 miles an hour instead of just at one location having a big drop of 60 to 30. Sometimes you need to make sure you got adequate speed signing out there and not expect drivers just to guess or the speed limit changes. School areas. Using a fluorescent yellow green sign. Where you're approaching a school speed zone on a road that's going to entail a sizable drop in speed, they're suggesting that you consider using this advanced warning sign to tell drivers that you're about to enter a school zone, you're gonna need to drop your speed by whatever amount it is to give drivers a heads up to take the foot off the gas. Assemblies of school signs, a number of parts are put together to make your school speed limit assembly. And you have a number of different options, depending on the practices in the local jurisdiction. Now, Arkansas law specifies, I think when children are present, if I'm remembering this correctly, which is actually a rather ineffective way of doing it. A number of years ago, someone published a study where they compared the different alternatives. They studied near 38 elementary schools. They compared driver response to these four treatments with the four diamonds here. And they found that the uh, flashing lights produced a uh, five to seven mile per hour greater drop than just when present. So they got a uh, much bigger response if you're McCullough response drivers slowing down by having the yellow flashing lights much better with the yellow flashing lights less effect when children are present 
And of course, you need to tell drivers where the school speed zone ended. However, the current method in the manual, in my opinion, is lacking because, okay, it tells you the end of the school speed limit, but it doesn't tell you what the speed limit is now. They actually contradict their own suggestion elsewhere of you know, giving the drivers adequate information to know what the speed limit is. Here's one setup. You've got a school crosswalk here. You step back in advance. You've got the crosswalk advance warning assembly. Upstream of that, you've got a school speed limit. And then you've got an optional school type of sign here. Now, what is lacking is dimensions. In the past, my recollection is they provided dimensions, but they've uh, backed away from that. So what I've done here is tried to reproduce what RDOT does when they're installing the school zone. Let's start our reference point. Here's the school crosswalk. In advance of that, go to the school property line, and then 300 feet in advance of that, RDOT puts the school speed limit sign. And then depending on the speed of the roadway, they set the dimension for how far in advance of the school speed limit, they put this advanced notification assembly. So you got this sign here at this distance in advance of the speed limit. And the speed limit is 300 feet in advance of the school property line edge. And then you go downstream to wherever the oncoming speed limit sign is. And notice how RDOT handles it. They install the end of, end of school speed limit but then they also are considerate and give you the information you need to know as to what, to what speed you can now resume. Compare the installation with what's in the manual. What do you think? It almost looks like they just picked up what they had lying around available and slapped it up on a pole. It's a mishmash of a lot of different elements, uh, certainly not a desirable school speed limit assembly. What do you think about this installation? You may not be able to critique this one because the school flasher is so hidden that you might not have even noticed that there's an obstructed school flasher there. That goes back to my comment much earlier in the class that over the intervening years, I have observed a growing problem with growing vegetation covering up traffic control devices. Case in point. The manual stresses the desirability of uniformity. Schools are contentious areas because parents are concerned about their children. From studies and observation, people have, have made a scientific examination of the situation, have come up with these observations.
The practice of safe routes to school has been around for decades. However, some wise sage questioned that title because nothing is absolutely safe. So maybe safer routes to school would be a, a better term. And I'm not going to go through all of these statements in detail, but if you uh, refer to the PDF and read through that, you will see a lot of observations from different people about the effectiveness of speed limits, problems with speed limits, the uh, ironies and inconsistencies of people in a local area demanding a lower speed limit. So the government acquiesces and installs a lower speed limit that's unjustified from an engineering perspective. And then the police go out and enforce and enforce it. And it turns out that the local residents who had been demanding the lower speed limit are some of the first ones to get tickets from violating the speed limit. They want everybody else to have to slow down they just don't want to have to slow down themselves. All right, at this point, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, one is regarding the federal and state school speed limits, um, and they're suggesting that that should be a 25 mile an hour speed limit rather than 20 miles per hour. Do you have any comment on that? <coughs> That varies from state to state. The, uh, without going back and looking, saying this from memory, the Arkansas uh, just a minute, let me control my screen here a minute. This is a uh, Now, I learned from previous experience that trying to go to the uh, the uh, function that shows you all the slides will not work at this point in time. Just go back to the Arkansas law instead of me just trying to remember it. That's what I thought says 25 miles per hour okay you're not seeing it just a minute try this again there we go okay the arkansas law says 25 miles an hour uh, different states have different practices this is something that uh Oh, I'm having to think back here. It's been many decades ago. I conducted a nationwide survey. And I, I'm saying this from memory. I'm having to pull something from out of the back of the mental file cabinet here. I believe 20 miles per hour was the one that I found most commonly used across the different people or you know, different jurisdictions that responded to the survey. This is a issue that different people have different opinions again my recollection was there was one or there were one or two states that set like a 15 mile an hour school speed limit so practices vary across the country all right very good we do have one other question regarding um, in arkansas the interstate speed limit for much of the state has recently changed from 70 to 75 miles per hour. Uh, do you have any comments on whether this will affect the number of accidents that we see on those roadways? Well, unfortunately, I'm not a fortune teller. If I were, I would uh, be investing a lot in the stock market. Uh, I remember a conversation I had a number of years ago with someone, <clears throat> and this was simply a, a guess, that there might be a slight increase, 
but the numbers rise and fall from year to year anyway. Uh, you might not be able to, to you might say pick out how much of the effect the rise and fall was to the speed limit as compared to just the normal variation from one year to the next. And there is a factor that I heard someone with Federal Highway Administration bring up many years ago. If you raise the speed limit on the freeways, to some degree, you are going to perhaps, at least in theory, attract traffic to draw traffic away from the older two lane roads. And the freeways are just inherently a lot safer than the two lane roads they replaced. So how do you factor that aspect in? If you take someone off a two lane road and put them on the freeway, you're going to probably have fewer accidents on the two lane road. So you get a benefit there also. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of factors to try to uh, figure out and maybe difficulty to tease out the truth from that. Very good, thank you for those comments. Um, looks like that's all we have for this section. So if you are ready to move to the next module, I think we are to that point. Well, give me a moment and let me see. Now I see I pressed the X and nothing. Okay, I pressed it again. Something finally happened, but uh, seems like sometimes there is a little lag between pressing and what actually transpires and you never know if you didn't press correctly or just exactly what's going on it appears like we are up and up and running for six but i'll tell you what looking at the time Let's uh, try to throw in a, another short break in there. Let me set up the hourglass. Let's start another 10 minute break, okay? Very good. We will be back in 10 minutes. All right, welcome back. We are ready to begin the next module on intersection control. Possible levels of control at an intersection. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you stop and think about it, you could create a hierarchy of signals at the top that require the least amount of judgment from drivers and work your way down the different levels always stop, two way stop, yield, and no control, which requires more driver judgment than any of the other options. We don't see a lot of no control in the middle of the country. I have seen more of this out in the western part of the U.S., perhaps because they have wide open spaces and uh, you can see oncoming traffic on cross streets more easily. But I don't know the real reason for that. That's just a guess. When is a signal justified? They use the term warrants. Warranted is the same as justified. Signals can be controversial, just like so many other aspects of traffic control devices. A, just like uh, with other things we've talked about, signals are not cure-alls. Signals don't make problems go away. And through experience, Traffic engineers have to some degree uh, grabbed a handle on when is a signal a good thing and when is a signal actually going to not be a benefit. As we said, sometimes signals are not what you want, even though you get public pressure to put in a signal. You see from these excerpts that people still can have fatal crashes with a signal.
To put in a signal, the manual has a practice or procedure, excuse me, for going through a, and evaluating the uh, situation, and they call these justifications warrants. If you're considering a location for a signal, they want you to conduct an engineering study. To do this study, you accumulate, you acquire data about the location, lanes, volumes, crash history. There are a number of warrants. You might think of these warrants as scenarios or situations that may justify the installation of a signal. For you got a situation with a stop sign and traffic is not being accommodated with stop control, look at the back up there, that may be an indicator that it's time to go to a traffic signal. One of the warrants, and there's, these are different warrants, they operate differently. You look at eight hours of volume, and if your volume exceeds these thresholds, then you are said to have warranted or justified a traffic signal. Now, these are not mandatory. You don't have to put the traffic signal in, but if you exceed these thresholds, then you may seriously need to be considering putting a signal in. No, no two locations are exactly alike. One size does not fit all, but these warrants uh, provide a good uh, benchmark or threshold of levels to uh, where if you exceed the, the level of volume, you may want to consider a signal. The second warrant, instead of using eight hours of volume, uses four hours of volume. And instead of a table, it works off of a graph. You find your volume on the major street, sum of both directions, and then the volume on the minor street, the greater of the two directions for four hours, and perform the intersection of the y and the x axis. You have three lines depending on the number of lanes in a direction for the through street and the cross street. If your volume plots above the applicable line, in other words, if you're on uh, the intersection of two four lane streets, then this would be the applicable line. If your volume on the cross street and the through street plots above this line, then you are said to have met that warrant for installing a traffic signal. One of the warrants is based on school crossing criteria. And again, this is something that uh, remotely I'm not going to delve into deeply, but I will just skim over this. Again, with the PDF printout, you can uh, go back and get more detail and study this more in depth. What they're looking for is do you or do you not have adequate gaps in the through traffic in which the school children can cross? If you average less than one adequate gap per minute, then they're saying that's an indication you may warrant a signal. A publication called the Traffic Control Devices Handbook is referred to that spells out the procedure. I've got a numerical example here. Again, I'm not going to step through this over the internet. But 
but the computations are there or an example computation that you could follow to determine if you at your particular location based on traffic volume and uh, school pedestrian volume have a uh, or they, uh, or walking speed have an uh, adequate number of gaps. Signal faces. The manual says that you are to have at least two signal faces for the primary movement. Here's an example of just one signal face. And the reason for the requirement is kind of obvious. You don't have a lot of uh, grabbing the driver's attention with just one signal face. Another reason for duplicate signals, uh, they don't always work. Signals overhead or side mounted signals? What do you think? Signals on the side are not as detectable. They are more easily overlooked by the drivers. Having the signal on a mast arm suspended over the roadway makes the signals much more visible, much more likely to grab the driver's attention more likely to be effective. Let's look at this situation. Having that leftmost signal head positioned here, I have seen this make motorists think that this is a left turn lane. Well, it is a left turn lane, but it's a left turn lane for oncoming traffic. In other words, if this white vehicle pulls in this lane to make a left turn, they're facing a head on collision from oncoming left turners. So here's a very misleading application, a very misleading installation of traffic signals, having these two such that the left one is over a lane to which it does not apply. We want to be able to see the signal. So the manual has a number of stipulations about how close to the intersection, how far away from the intersection, and signal height, how far above the ground. Case in point of where the placing of the stop bar and the overhead signal was such that the driver did not see the signal above him, but saw a signal in the distance and misinterpreted which signal applied. And that's a rather hefty award there for violating the MVTCD essentially at least 40 feet away from the stop line, but not more than 180 feet away, unless you can read the difference there, the stipulation. Mounting height of signal faces. They provide a graph that shows you, depending on how far away the signal is from the stop line, the height that the signal is required to be. What they're wanting to accomplish with this is have the signal such that the driver can see it as opposed to the, the roof of the driver's car blocking the driver's view from seeing the signal. If we all drove around in convertibles, this wouldn't be an issue. But since most of us have a roof over our head when we drive, you've got to have the signal position, both distance and height, such that the driver's field of view, the driver's line of sight, is not obstructed by the top of the vehicle. Let's talk about the combination of signals and signs. 
they got the signal out over the street. This sign would be much more effective if it had been put up here on the mast arm, because let's, here again, think it through. When you're driving down the road and you got traffic signals, your view is sort of tunnel vision, not exactly, but to some degree, you're narrowly focused on the signals ahead and you're not uh, using a lot of peripheral vision to see things out to the far left or right. You're trying to focus on signal changes. So to be in the driver's field of view, this sign should be up here on the mask arm. Back plates with reflective borders enhance the driver's ability to detect the signal. And it's one of the counter safety countermeasures that the federal government is emphasizing. Notice um, very sizable reduction in crashes with the use of the uh, reflective border. Here's something they do in Missouri that is quite helpful. In advance of some traffic signals, especially those where uh, you're maybe on a higher speed road, they will put a signal ahead sign, and it is, you might say, wired into the traffic signal. So as you're driving down the road, and this signal is approaching the time it's going to turn red, you will start to get an indication here. Now notice the signal's not actually red yet, but this is many hundreds of feet in advance of the signal telling drivers approaching over the crest of the, sig of the hill that they are about to see a red signal ahead of them. And if you properly time this and coordinate it, it can be a great help in reducing um, drivers having to slam on the brakes and perhaps going through a red signal or having a rear end collision with vehicles already stopped at the signal. Just like with the justifications for traffic signals, there are also justifications for multi-way stops. The criteria for multi-way stop applications, there, there are different criteria. One is when you're about to put in a traffic signal, but it takes time to fabricate it, to deliver it, and to install it. During that interim uh, period of time, days, weeks, and months, you can go with a multi-way stop while you're waiting for the signal to be installed. If you had five or more reported crashes in a successive 12 month period, crashes of the type that would not have happened or likely would not have happened if you had had a multi way stop, is another uh, criteria for when to install multi way. Or there's a set of combinations of volumes. This gets a little complicated. The vehicular volume from the major road, sum of both directions of travel, averages at least 300 per hour for any eight hours. These are non-overlapping eight hours, eight separate hours, but it doesn't have to be eight continuous hours, just any eight separate hour periods of the day. And during those same eight hour periods, the total vehicular, pedestrian, and bicycle volume from the sum of both approaches. Now, this is different from traffic signals. From and traffic signal works we used on the minor street, the greater of the two approaches on the minor road, not the sum of both, this whichever of the two was the greater one. But here with stop signs, they're summing total of both approaches also on the minor street at least 200 per hour for these same eight hours. And 
you have this much delay, <clears throat> that can be a justification for going to always stop. But then they've got provisions to lower those amounts if the traffic's over 40 miles per hour. So you go to 70% of these numbers if your major street speed is over 40. And then they've got a provision for mixing and matching using 80% of the previous criteria. Installation. Where you got multi-way stops, the only acceptable supplemental plaque is the required all-way. They don't want you to say four-way, they want all-way. And if you got you know, all directions stopping, this plaque is, whoops, my mouse disappeared, times out, this plaque is required. Supplemental plaques such as two-way, three-way, or four-way shall not be used. Yet another example of a passage that certainly we can guess was put in there to keep people, to stop people from doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. I've already stressed this point about signs being in the driver's field of view, and it certainly applies to stop signs too. And this can be problematic in some skew, especially skewed angle locations or other types of situations, can be challenging to get the stop sign within the main core of the driver's field of view. Where you've got these separate right turning roadways, the manual requires the yield sign to be on the right. Unfortunately, that is not where the driver's field of vision is. When you're in one of these right turning roadways, your field of view, your line of sight is not off here to the far right. It's more of in this orientation I'm trying to trace out with the mouse. So having a second yield sign over on the left can be a great help. Railroad grade crossings are a type of intersection. Where you have passive control, that means all that is there is a cross buck. There are no uh, flashing lights or a gate, nothing that is activated by the approach of an oncoming train. Then the manual requires not only do you have the cross buck, but you have reflective strips on the post. You specify the uh, extra number of, tr of tracks, like two or more tracks. And also, you install a stop or a yield on that post. In addition, there are requirements for pavement markings and, of course, the advance warning sign. So the text from the MUTCD, a grade crossing crossbuck assembly consists of the crossbuck, the number of track sign, if it's two or more, and either a yield or a stop. So this passage here is what I've tried to break out into parts with the bullets above. Here's a picture of the installation. Your cross buck, number of tracks, yield or stop, and a reflective strip. Also a reflective strip on the back side of the post. The deadline for compliance with this requirement was the end of 2019. But I, unfortunately, think you can still find railroad crossings out there that are not up to snuff. If you've got one in your jurisdiction, I would strongly urge you to get with the railroad company and determine, according to how you all do business, who's responsible for getting these crossbook installations up to compliance with the current manual. Uh, take care of that before you got an accident at your crossing and uh, 
you have some tort liability as a result of it. Here's a, another version of the installation. The manual wants you to not normally mix signals and yield or stop signs. Yield or stop signs shall not be used in conjunction with a traffic signal with the following exceptions. And one of those exceptions is if you have a channelized right turn lane, such as we saw earlier, with an island separating the turning roadway from the other movements, then you might have a yield sign for that right turning roadway. The meaning of signal indications, a steady red arrow indicates you shall not make that movement. A steady green arrow means you are allowed to make that movement, but also that green arrow should not be displayed if there are conflicts with other uh, legal uh, movements. So you don't want to use a green arrow unless you double checked that you are not having conflicts with authorized pedestrian movements or other authorized vehicle movements. So that leads me to these photos. They've got a yield sign used with traffic signals. I, uh, I severely question whether this is legit or not. And if uh, someone has a collision because of the confusion this creates, here again, we could be looking at some serious tort liability. You want your jurisdiction to have a plan in place to respond, not if, but when a signal is struck and knocked down or otherwise made inoperable. Because when signals are out, there are obvious problems. I was conducting a traffic study with some students a few years ago at this location and a few miles away, a car ran off the road and struck a utility pole, uh, knocking out power in the area. And this intersection for a number of minutes was like dodging cars. Uh, we did not see anybody get hit, but it was a miracle that there wasn't a fender bender here. There are provisions and this is one of these rare cases where portable signs are allowed. When you have a signal that goes out, but if you're going to be using a portable, say a portable stop sign, when the signal goes out, you need to make sure that you have a provision to have someone remove that before the signal goes back into operation again, because you don't want your portable stop sign out there at the same time that the signal is displaying red, yellow, green. Should be green, yellow, red, shouldn't it? <coughs> Railroad grade crossings. There's a move afoot to try to close crossings that you can really uh, get by without because it's just one more potential safety problem. Uh, why not try to just get rid of it? This is not as uh, applicable to certainly a lot of crossings, but there are some crossings out there that you probably really don't need. Sources of information. Unsignalized intersection improvement guide, suggestions for dealing with unsignalized intersections that maybe are causing you problems. 
I guess I should turn to Dr. Williams and ask, are there any questions? The only question that has come up is um, more of an opinion question on signalized intersections versus roundabouts. <clears throat> Just a minute, let me see if I can. Uh, there's a little lag in bringing that up. There we go. Signalized intersections versus roundabouts. <clears throat> well, um, how many hours do we have to talk about that? <laughs> there have been a lot of. <laughs> let me approach that differently, huh? Then I started to. Do you want the facts or do you want the emotion? There's one school of thought out there that anything new is terrible. And so you can get public opposition with roundabouts. With a roundabout, especially a multi-lane roundabout, the devil is in the details of how it's designed. If it is well designed, Studies have shown that in a lot of situations, roundabouts can drive your crash numbers down considerably, especially the more severe crashes. Uh, there have been a few instances where roundabouts were put in and made things worse. I certainly obviously don't know all the situations, but I do know one famous one that seems to have been a design problem because they changed the geometrics of the layout and the problem seems to have cleared itself up. Um, in general, roundabouts seem to help, but like I said earlier in a different context, one size doesn't always fit all. In many locations, however, roundabouts can, can be an improvement to drive, uh, drive crashes down and perhaps even reduce delay at intersections. But it, it depends on the particulars of a location. Very good. Um, at this time, that's all we have. Again, if you come up with any questions or think of anything, pop that in the questions pod and we will get to it at the next pause. Let me move my windows around. Each time I open a new module, it has a mind of its own. So I have to uh, do a little desktop housekeeping before I can proceed. And one more little button I need to flip here. Give me just a moment. Okay, I think we are set up now. Temporary traffic control is the title, but for most of us, most of the time, it is work zones. So work zones are one type and the most prominent type of temporary traffic control. That's with some other words we have talked about. Temporary is a little misleading because work zones can go on for years. The thought they are trying to convey with temporary, I think, is it's not the normal, it's not the long-term situation. Some of the topics we want to address, worker protection, uh, setting up work zones, the devices you use, uh, work zone speed is always problematic talk a little about flagging, and then, as we have in other modules, provide some examples. Now, I realize when we're dealing with the driving public, not everyone was at the top of the class. So we've got a wide range of driver abilities that can uh, really uh, perhaps raise their head, raise their ugly head in work zones. Work zones need special attention. Why the concern? Well, let's look at some of the numbers. In Arkansas, we're looking at roughly three workers, roadway workers, killed per year in work zones. Now, a much larger number of just 
overall fatalities in work zones each year. So what's that average of 14 per year over the past 10 years of total fatalities? The combination of moving traffic and unaware drivers, workers close to traffic, gives you more exposure to problems. And in spite of these numbers, sometimes you scratch your head just how much thought did go into that work zone. Looking at the numbers on the preceding slide, I think maybe we need a little more thought that goes in the work zones. Worker protection. Federal law requires that for federal aid roads, roads that have received federal aid, all workers within the right-of-way shall wear high visibility safety apparel. And a similar provision following down the text applies to firefighters and other emergency responders. Now the manual itself, which realized, as we've said, has been adopted into state law by, by inference or by reference, all workers, including emergency responders who are in the right of way, are to be wearing the safety apparel that meets class two or three requirements. We're going to see class two or three in just a minute. What I'm trying to emphasize here is that you've got a lot of provisions that require not only the road workers, but the policemen, the firemen, the others out in the roadway to be wearing safety vests. Now, as promised, I tried to take information from various sources and combine it into a tabular form to get a better sense of what's what. The class two or class three apparel that we saw mentioned on the previous slides. Class two does not have sleeves. Class three does have sleeves. Now I have worked out on the road and I have worn these vests and I know they are not all that comfortable, especially in hot weather, but they are required. And even if they're not required, they do give you some measure of visibility and therefore safety. My recommendation would be to have a better chance of being covered in a wide variety of situations, just go with the class three. Now, sometimes you're gonna be having to implement an even a higher class, but for your normal city streets, in perhaps the majority of situations, if you're wearing the vest with sleeves, you're going to be in compliance. When you purchase them, examine the labels, the tags, to make sure they comply with the federal standards. Notice these two pictures. This was well fairly early in the morning, a heavy cloud cover. If these road workers had not been wearing the safety vest, they would have been practically invisible. Notice the contrast between one officer wearing orange, which is not the standard, the other one wearing what I call the lime green, the safety green, yellow green. In my opinion, this is much more visible than is the orange. And also this applies to your school crossing guards in your city or town. If they are out there in the road, you've got some potential liability problems if they are not wearing safety vests. The amount of effort, the type of devices that are required of you in a school zone are affected by a number of factors. One of the sets of factors has to do with how many days or how many hours long you're going to be out in the road. Notice this hierarchy from more than three days to mobile work that moves down the road. So depending on the duration, as you delve into part six of the manual, you're going to find one of these duration categories is going to affect 
how much is required of you in a work zone as far as what types of signs, etc. Also, your installation will be affected by where you are within the right of way, one of these five categories. And don't forget the pedestrians. Over the recent decades, there has been a growing awareness and therefore emphasis in accommodating pedestrians through work zones. Notice this is a standard in the MUTCD. If the temporary traffic control zone affects pedestrians, then access and walkways shall be provided. Work zone setups, especially involving tapers and lane closures. Let's look at the components. We're going to uh, delve into this in more depth later in this module. So this is just the beginning of a, a series of discussions about this topic of cone or channelizing device setup. You've got an advanced warning area where your advanced signs will go. You've got a transition area where you have a straight taper, a straight line taper with channelizing devices. You've got a buffer area in advance of the actual work. You've got the work area itself, and then you've got an area in which you terminate your temporary contra uh, traffic control or your work zone area. Now tapers, we've got to put together a, a number of, or a group of different sources. I'm gonna, over a couple of slides here, try to show you the components. First, you have the drawing aspect, trying to graphically communicate what this value L is. So our objective here in just a minute is going to be to calculate how many feet long L is. But before we do that, notice if you're merging two lanes into one, the length of that transition is to be L long. If you're just shifting laterally, but not merging, the length of that shift is one half of L. If you're closing off a shoulder, your taper length is one third of L. And finally, where you got a flagger situation where you're having one-way traffic in one lane alternating directions at a time based on the fire controls, then you got a short taper of 50 to 100 feet. L doesn't apply in this situation. So this is where L is. Now the calculation for L based on your speed and the number of feet of lateral shift determines how long L is. This table reproduces the information from the previous slide's drawings, whether you use L or one half L or one third of L. Let's look at the components now. We've previously talked about principles and formulas. Let's get down to the nitty gritty of numbers. I went through the equation and calculated the outcomes for a 12 foot wide lateral shift. If you're shifting laterally 12 feet wide in your uh, taper to merge two lanes into one, then here are the values you get for L for various speeds. The spacing between the channelizing devices and the taper is the value in this row, and the spacing between the channelizing devices and the tangent is, notice, twice the value as you saw in the taper. When you're Installing, when you're putting down the channelizing devices, you begin at the upstream end and you work in this direction. When you're picking up at the end of the job, you start at the downstream end 
and work backward in that direction. Flaggers. We call them flaggers, but flagging is discouraged, or the use of flags itself. So what they want you to use is a slow stop paddle because experience has shown that flagging or hand movements are confusing and not well understood. They don't clearly communicate. They allow you to use a flag only in case of an emergency where you don't have time to get the stop slow paddle. If you've got a situation planned out in advance, that's not an emergency. I have seen the suggestion that the person stationed at the flagging position be provided with an air horn on a lanyard around their neck or clipped to their belt that they can sound if they see a driver veering off into the worker areas to warn the drivers, give them a little, I'm excuse me, to warn the uh, workers to give them a little more heads up. Devices in a work zone. The regulatory signs you put up are the normal ones. The warning signs go to the orange background. The barricades, alternating orange and white stripes. There are three types of barricades and again, what I've had done here is pulled together information from various parts of the manual and tried to make a sort of a semi table to give you some guidance of when you're supposed to use a type one, a type two, or a type three barricade. Now notice they said high speed roadway, but they didn't define high speed. And the MUTCD has some inconsistency. In one place, it means greater than 35, but in the part, part six, where they're talking about temporary traffic control, they define somewhere, not here, but somewhere within this part, as greater than or equal to 45 miles per hour. So since within the overall part six, they use this definition for high speed, that is what I would have to assume would apply to when they say high speed roadways in discussing the barricades. Let's look critically at one of the examples in the MUTCD. You may recall earlier I said, you know, 99.99% .99 of the time the MUTCD is going to do it better than what you or I could come up with. Well, Here's that 0.001%. Notice in this drawing, you've got a road closed here, which in essence makes these dead end streets. But the street is open for traffic going to the abutting property in this block. You just can't go through. Again, this closure has in effect made this and this a dead end street. They're showing these barricades right up here at the intersection. That may not be a good idea. And once again, I'm repeating myself, think it through. How is this going to work? Traffic from a cross street, traffic turning right, you see traffic's going to get gummed up. So following this drawing as presented may not be a good idea in every situation. Going through the words that we find in part six related to this, if the road is open for some distance beyond the intersection, you may want to locate your barricades at the edge of the traveled way. In other words, not having them out in the middle of the roadway blocking traffic. They're referring to the barricades right here, these barricades. 
So blocking traffic, you can see, creates problems. Maybe put these barricades off to the side of the road. I asked someone at the Federal Highway Administration Resource Center about this, and here is his response. This is guidance and a minimum solution. You need to use some judgment when you're trying to implement this in the field. Detours. Can drivers figure out what you have detoured? How about this? What detour? Does this really give drivers the guidance they need? The manual is showing not only a detour sign, but enough information to tell the driver just what road is being detoured. Here's one of the many example drawings from part six, showing a layout to give you guidance on how to implement your detour that goes with your road closure. Part six has many, many drawings to give you examples to help you figure it out. Speeds in work zones. This is a problematic topic. Um, it may be that it's just not realistic for drivers to go lower than a certain speed and you may need to design your project, your work area, so it will accommodate what drivers are driving. You don't want to create situations where you're telling drivers something that isn't true, leaving drive closed, road closed, signs out there when the road isn't closed is just an invitation for drivers to disregard your signs. And then when it really is closed for drivers to violate the closure because they have learned not to trust you if you leave these signs out when they're not really true. How is this going to work? After you've put in an installation, you may need to study it to see if there are some unforeseen consequences. You've got a flagger, a you know, uh, one lane closed, so the other direction has to operate one way at a time and alternate between who gets to go and who has to stop, but you've got a signal at the intersection. Well, <clears throat> here's what really happened in that situation. But you ended up with traffic in opposing directions just blocking each other because they hadn't thought it through how they were going to operate in conjunction with the signal. Are you creating a problem with your work zone devices? Not too good to be blocking the view of the stop sign with this detour sign. This doesn't appear to be something you want to have out there on the road either. We've created a visual obstruction, the driver in the left turn lane, that's the perspective from which I took the photograph, cannot see oncoming traffic in the inside lane here. An invitation for close, close calls and uh, side angle collisions here. They've closed off the intersection working for many hours, but left the traffic signal going, showing green when it's serving nobody. Maybe they should have retimed the traffic signal while the work was going on. What do you think about this installation? little late with the road closed ahead sign, aren't they? And this one? 
the cone taper is more than a little short? Can you even see the detour sign mounted way too low to be seen by drivers in the street? And of course, traffic control areas, temp work zones, temporary traffic control areas, work zones need babysitting. Well, what do you think about this? Does it look like the road is closed ahead? Somebody is not doing their job of taking the signs down when the closure is not in effect. Not doing a very good job of advising motors that there's a work area just around the curve ahead. A couple of words about a different type of temporary traffic control called a traffic incident. This is something that I don't see used very often, but uh, I'll explain why it's in here in just a moment. First, what is an incident? One of these rather short term events where one of the lanes or one or more of the lanes is closed because of some unexpected event. Due to some apparent confusion and misuse of what the Federal Highway Administration intended, a few years ago they put out a memorandum uh, trying to clarify when to and when not to use these coral signs. The road on which the incident has occurred remains open to traffic, it's just some of the lanes are closed, not all of them and applies to incidents lasting up to 24 hours. So partial road closure and less than a day. We're going to close out this module with a exercise. Now, normally conducting this class live, we would give uh, groups of three to five people in the class, divide up into groups, uh, give them some materials to perform this exercise. But since we're doing this remotely and long distance, we'll have to come up with an alternative. It's not as good as letting everybody have hands-on experience. I've repeated the tables with the equations we saw earlier. If you've got a smartphone with a calculator or you've got a calculator handy and a pad of paper, you can work this. So we're going to be using these equations and the guidance in this table. We're going to have a lane closure and a merging taper, merge two lanes of traffic into one because this outside lane is closed. On a roadway with a 30 mile an hour speed, we're going to be shifting laterally, shifting sideways 12 feet. We need to figure out how long should the taper be how much distance between channelizing devices in the taper and channelizing devices in the tangent. Here again, the equations. We're dealing with 30 miles an hour, so 40 miles an hour or less. Here's our equation for L. I'm going to pause a minute and ask you to compute how long does this straight taper need to be for a 30 mile an hour road shifting laterally 12 feet.
we do have a few answers coming in through the questions pod so far. Looks like folks are getting 180 feet. Well, I'm encouraged. There's the substitution into the equation, and there's the distance, 180. So it appears that people know how to handle this. Now, what is that actually going to look like? for 30 miles an hour, 180 feet. The spacing between the channelizing devices, 30 feet in the taper, 60 feet in the tangent. And stop sharing. Okay, I'm not getting the, the screen to come up. I might have been wrong here. Quick stop. I still a quick stop. You got it. You should have it. Okay. Ah. <clears throat> Here's the board we would give to <clears throat> excuse me. getting froggy here at the end of the four hours. <clears throat> and I practiced this yesterday. Let's see if I can replicate it. On this scale, one inch equals 10 feet. Here's our work area. And the straight part of the, or tangent part of the closure, 60 feet apart or six inches to scale. Now we need to start our taper. Our taper will be 180 feet or 18 inches long. These devices at 30 feet intervals. Whoops. Hundred and fifty and a hundred and eighty. <clears throat> Excuse me. And let me study how that is appearing on your screens. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of a <clears throat> warp with the overhead camera, but in real life, this is a straight line. This edge is, but you're, you're seeing a slight curvature of bow. Let me try moving this. this. That straightens it somewhat, doesn't it? Makes it a little better. <clears throat> so you're 180 foot long straight taper, 30 feet between channelizing devices. And then once you're in the tangent part of the closure, 60 feet between devices. And that is the end of that module. Let me pull up the last module now. And uh, do, 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 do. okay, I'll <laughs> I pressed the wrong button there. Okay, show screen. While you guys are getting that set up and switched back over. Um, I will make one comment regarding safety vest and retro reflective requirements. Um, Halloween is coming up really soon. So if you need costume ideas for your kiddos or grandkids, you can find them if they're wearing a class three vest. So if they wanna go dressed as a construction worker, primo, you can find them and keep up with them. Did we have any questions with the end of that module? There are no other questions at this time. Okay, once again, let me resize my screen windows here with the new. And 
It looks like we are all set up. <clears throat> well, let's close out this class by looking at changes in resources. <clears throat> Excuse me. From time to time, the manual is revised, and as we said at the beginning, we're going to guess we'll see a new manual in 2022. The Federal Highway Administration issues other <clears throat> rulings and directives from time to time. Some recent examples. What do you think about this installation? This is one of these somebody did it and then FHWA responded by saying don't do that again. <clears throat> it appears somebody's trying to say left lane turns left and right lane turns right but whoever did this didn't really know how to achieve their objective. Um, Obviously, this was a this is a fail. I think we could say. <clears throat> Another example of changes uh, going back and forth over the use of rectangular rapid flashing beacons uh, terminated in 2017 because it was a patented device and. FHWA did not want to have patented devices in effect or allowed, but some good soul purchased the patent and then turned it into the public domain. So FHWA once again allowed RRFDs. Sources of information, once again, Printing out the PDF of the class materials will give you access to this. The address for looking up the MUTCD and keeping up with changes. Free downloads of the MUTCD and the list of known errors. Frequently asked questions. <coughs> Excuse me. The publication standard highway signs. As that, and as an aside, after we get the new manual that we're again guessing will happen in 2022, uh, that will probably be followed by a new version of standard highway signs sometime afterward. Here's an example of what you find in standard highway signs. type of information. A resource <clears throat> a resource to uh, deal with local roads put out by uh, Cornell University. A source for information on uncontrolled marked pedestrian crosswalks. In other words, there's not a traffic signal there. An app that you can put on your smartphone to have some MUTCD information to carry out in the field with you. Federal Highway Administration's efforts to promote simple and effective Treatments to improve safety. The web location for that. And finally, contacts with the Arkansas Department of Transportation to provide help with signals, signs, and pavement markings, and the overall issue of technology transfer. Other classes offered by the state's technology transfer pro program. And in closing, let me reemphasize 
check the MUTCD before you go into action. They have decades of experience reflected in the contents. And most of the time, you're going to find a application, a solution in there that will enhance your ability to be as effective as you can be. But even after you do an installation, look at it and think it through. Sometimes it's hard to see in advance, but there can be perhaps some unintended consequences of grouping certain traffic control devices together. And once again, there we go. And hopefully you will take this information and not just set it aside, but examine your practices, look for ways you could step up your game and give the best service to the public that you can. If you see that you need to make some sort of change, I suggest you consider first acting, implementing, applying them to the roadways that have the higher volumes and the higher speeds in your jurisdictions. And with that, I will give it back to you, Dr. Williams. You may have any questions or closing comments? All right, thank you. Um, no further questions that I can tell at this time. So I think we are probably good to go ahead and close out. I'm going to show one last slide here on the screen. Let me get that posted here. This will be our website. Get it to go. All right. So you should see our um, website for the T-Square program. Feel free to go and check that out. We will have a recording of the webinar, should be available um, in a few days. But also check out the homepage in the yellow section. There are other classes. A lot of them are webinars that you can register for. Feel free to, to look through that as well as the hot topics on the homepage. Um, when you close out the webinar, you should get an evaluation. It will be either pop up then or it will be emailed after the fact. Uh, different connections will do that different ways. We would be interested to hear your thoughts and, and suggestions on how to make the class better. Again, this was the first time we did this course as a webinar, so uh, thank you for your patience with things. I think Dr. Gaddis did a fantastic job and we got a lot of good information that we can build on. Um, and with that, I believe we are all finished. So it doesn't look like any other questions have come in in these last couple of minutes. So I will leave this screen on for a few more minutes so that if you want to write that website down, you can. And one other note, if you did have a group of folks watching the webinar with you that were not actually registered separately, uh, some of you already have those names. If you have not sent me those names before, if you would do that, that would be great so that they can also get a certificate and credit for the class. And that is all I have. Thank you all so much. Have a great day.